Well, I'm glad to welcome you to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And tonight's session is going to exemplify a comment that is often made about the Gospel in general. They say it's shallow enough for a child to wade in and it's deep enough to wash an elephant in. What they mean by that, of course, is that it works for beginners very comfortably. Many people recommend this Gospel as your first exposure to the Bible. On the other hand, it's also the one that will challenge the most seasoned scholar about the Bible. So it works both ways. And tonight will be an example of that because it has some of the most profound truths in the entire Scripture. And yet it's done in such a direct, simple way, no one can miss the story, no matter how new they are to the material. So it's, a, it's going to exemplify that very characteristic. But we never want to enter the Word of God without prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this evening, and we know that in your kingdom there are no accidents, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. So it's our prayer, Father, that you will join us and open our hearts and lives to your word, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our coming King. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ indeed. Amen. The Gospel of John. And uh, so... We're in the, in the fourth session, and we're going to explore John chapter 3, a very rich uh, uh, chapter for many reasons. But for a little background, you may recall in the last session, I urged you to not only read the chapter, but to do a little homework in, the, in chapter Numbers 21 in the Torah, and uh, where it has this strange episode of the brazen or brass serpent. And uh, I, I challenge you to find a place where this episode is explained in the Old Testament. Where in the Old Testament? It's a very strange event. The more you think about it, the stranger it is. You would expect it to be explained somewhere in the Old Testament. And I challenge you to find a place where it is explained in the Old Testament. And the, the presence of this uh, event in the Torah, in the book of Numbers, one of the five books of Moses, has a profound implication for apologetics. Now, what do I mean by apologetics? That's a classic term meaning to speak in defense of something. And it's the, it's the uh, discipline of defending a position through the systematic exercise of reason. So apologetics is a specialized area of study. And we're called upon P by Peter's second letter who tells us to be ready always to give every man an answer of the reason of the hope that's in you. Now, don't let that mislead you. You don't come to faith through reasoning, but uh, it is a study. And the question I asked you last time is, how does the numbers event, the brazen serpent thing, help us from the point of view of apologetics in defending the faith in general? That was, my, that was the challenge. So what I'd like to do... For those of you that uh, did your homework, let's start by just this piece of background before we get into John chapter 3. And uh, we're going to turn to Numbers chapter 21, starting at verse 4. Bear in mind now we're in the Torah, the books of Moses. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Now they're discouraged because uh, they've, just, they've just had a major victory at uh, Hormah. And yet, they found reason to grumble. In fact, the, the, the wilderness wanderings is just from one grumble to the next. Okay? And, and, and how God, you really uh, can understand how they go out of their way to try his patience because he keeps doing these incredible miracles and still they grumble. So this is an example of that. Go on to verse 5 here. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathes this light bread. He's talking about the manna. They've had with the manna. They've had manna pancakes and they've had, you know, manna shevets, I guess. But anyway, whatever. Um, so they're speaking against that. In verse 6, Moses sends fiery serpents among them. And the, the word fiery refers to the, the, the poisonous bite of the snakes 
created a, a burning sensation, so that was a term. Uh, it felt like fire is the point. But then anyway, these serpents are biting people, and they died. And so, uh, and, they, and so they go to Moses and get to verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Now here he means one out of brass. And set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now that's a strange episode. Let's not dismiss the fact that's weird. God sent the, because they were grumbling and complaining, God sent these serpents that were poisonous. And it was obviously painful. And they died. And as that's starting to happen, they're upset. So Moses goes to the Lord, and the Lord sets up this remedy. He tells Moses to make a brass serpent, put it on a pole on top of the hill, and everyone that looks it will be healed. And they were. Okay. Now, you would think that this strange remedy would be explained somewhere. It certainly isn't straightforward. And uh, where in the Old Testament is this remedy uh, explained? And if you search the Old Testament, you will not find anywhere that this is rationalized or explained. Why did God choose this peculiar way to create a remedy for the snake bites? A brass serpent on a pole, why? <clears throat> now, and then, just looking at it would be the remedy, and they wouldn't die. Now, you can't escape the fact that's weird, okay? Now, there's lots of ways to apply this if you were preaching from this. See, the ancient Israelites were guilty of disobedience and grumbling with an unthankful spirit. They were under the condemnation of God and were being punished for their sin. That's the background here. The object elevated before them was simply the emblem of their judgment, okay? They were unable to rescue themselves. Nothing they could do could avoid the death from the bite, okay? The poison of the serpents was deadly, and there was no antidote for it. They were urged to look at the emblem in order to receive life. It's that simple. That's as much as you can extract by rationalizing this thing. In fact, it turns out 700 years later, that brass serpent is still around. They're worshiping it. And Hezekiah, when he uh, finds out about this, he's, he's purging the land of idols and other things. In 2 Kings 18, verse 4, speaking of Hezekiah, he removed the high places, those were the idol-worshiping areas, and he broke the images, and he cut down the groves. The groves were trees cut into phallic symbols that were part of the pagan worship in those days. And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. This brass serpent was still around and they were worshiping it like a fetish of some kind. It's like some people today take uh, the Shroud of Turin or something. It was around and it was still a notary, but they were worshiping the thing. And so Hezekiah called it Nehushtan. And that simply means in Hebrew, it's a thing of brass. So he destroyed it. He had to destroy it because they were all worshiping it. But that's 700 years later. So the impact of what happened back in the days of Moses was still being echoed through their culture. In fact, about 200 years after this, there's a guy by my Escalapius. I don't know if you ever heard of Escalapius. He apparently was a very skilled physician who practiced in Greece about 1200 B.C., Moses about 1450 B.C., to give you a feeling. So about two centuries after the event with the uh, brazen serpent, this legend starts about Escalapius. And in fact, it's described in Homer's Odyssey, by the way, or excuse me, Iliad. And Escalapius started, there was a legend he, that became a symbol of medicine. A, a snake on a pole becomes a symbol of healing. In the Jewish, in the uh, Hebrew culture, about 200 years after the Moses thing. Um, but anyway, uh, this uh, Escalapius, or it goes by either the Greek or the uh, Latin translation, he's considered the god of medicine in the Greek mythology and ancient Greek uh, uh, practices. 
And it's interesting that to this day, if you look at the World Health Organization, the symbol is a globe with a single pole. It's, they would tell you that's Aesculapius, which is based on the Greek legend, but they don't dig deeply enough. The Greek legend is based on Moses two centuries early before them. And if you look here in New Zealand, likewise, they have the, uh, it's embodied in the symbol and uh, in the medical council also. You see that when you see the single serpent on a pole, that goes back to Aesculapius. In fact, even one step earlier, it's, the, it's an echo of Numbers 21. Most people don't know that. In fact, in America, they messed this up. You might be, there's also a Greek god by the name of Hermes. And he is represented by two snakes on a pole. Okay, what make, he was the great messenger of gods in the Greek religion, and he was a guide presumably to the underworld. He was the, considered the patron of boundaries and of the travelers who crossed them, of the cunning thieves and weights and measures of invention, and thus he becomes a symbol of commerce. I'm always amused by this because if you see a doctor's license plate, you usually see a single pole and a snake after Asclepius can understand why. In America, more often than not, you see two snakes and the eagle, which happen. They think it's the ex expression of medicine. No, it's the, it's the expression of commerce. And so if you have certain cynicism about doctors, you might get a kick out of that. That's called a caduceus. And that's, uh, that comes from the herald staff. And it really speaks of Hermes. It was a short staff with two serpents, sometimes surmounted by wings. And in Roman iconography, it was depicted as the left hand of Mercury, and, and uh, he was the guide of the protector of merchants, shepherds, gamblers, liars, and thieves. And so, in fact, uh, if you look at some of the classic stuff here, uh, Mercury and the merchant approach, approaching here disapprovingly, uh, disapproving Aesculapius and the naked Graysons, who are the daughters of Aesculapius, by the way. And I won't get into all that here, but the main point is, is that Aesculapius dealt with patients. Merchants make deals with clients. That was the distinction. And uh, the distinction between a celebrated and the ancient art. And uh, so every time if you're in America and you're driving and you see the little caduceus, you can have a little chuckle at their expense if you like. So that's a little background on Numbers 21. Now let's shift in to what you came for, and that's John chapter 3. And uh, the visit of Nicodemus. And this is going to be interesting because... Jesus is going to take on the deepest topics in the scripture in such direct ways that we can't miss them. And so, uh, so let's take the first verse. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this guy seemed to have everything. He was a Pharisee, which was the key place to be from. He was disciplined and respected. He was wealthy and from a distinguished family. But he was also a ruler, technically, which implies he was in the Sanhedrin and a teacher, and not only a teacher, the teacher. But despite all of this, we'll discover, he was in the dark before he met Jesus. And that's what's going to come up here. Now, the Pharisees, you should understand them, a man of the Pharisees. Now, we often get disparaging about Pharisees because of some excessive legalism. However, he belonged to the best group in Israel. Uh, they believed in the inspiration of the Old Testament. They believed in the coming of the Messiah. And they believed in miracles. In fact, they believed in the resurrection. That distinguished them from the Sadducees, which were the liberals of that day. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. And that silly little pun will remind you which is which. The Pharisees were the conservatives. The Sadducees were the extreme liberals. It's interesting, by the way, as a footnote here, that many of the Pharisees came to faith in Christ. Many did. Many priests did. You can't find any record in the scripture of a Sadducee coming to faith. I'm not saying they didn't. It's just an interesting observation that you don't find any recorded in the scripture. And I think there's a, there's a lesson in all of that. But let's get back to Nicodemus. The Talmud records Nicodemus as one of the four richest men in Jerusalem and a disciple of Jesus. That's recorded in the, in the Jewish Talmud, strangely. Hoskins records that Nicodemus was a member of, an, of the arist, aristocratic family that furnished the, uh, furnished the Hasmonean king, Aristobulus II, with his ambassador to Pompeii in 63 BC. So this, he was very influential, from a very influential family is the point. And uh, 
His son, by the way, apparently was the man that negotiated the terms of surrender to the Roman garrison in Jerusalem prior to the final destruction of that city in 70 AD. So we find Nicodemus surfacing the family in, in history there. And uh, as we study John, we're going to see him progress from this visit that we're going to experience here in chapter 3, where he's visiting at night, and I'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, later on in chapter 7, he actually goes, he defends to some extent Jesus against the Sanhedrin. And then finally, of course, uh, he, he, anoint, he anointed Jesus' burial in, uh, in uh, John 19. We'll get to that later. Okay, we're down to verse 2. We're making progress here. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And so that's not a surprise to most people who know their Bible, know that he came at night. What most people miss is that the Greek verbs are in the plural, which implies that he represented a faction. He is speaking not, not just on his own for a group. And he's coming at night any for a lot of good reasons, but um, uh, it says we know. And the, uh, the plural in the Greek implies that he may be representing some kind of private group here. And uh, so that uh, and, and, uh, and it, they may have been among the Sanhedrin and impressed with the miracles. And so that thou art a teacher come from God. That's an interesting insight. Now, that raises some challenge for us. How do you tell if a teacher comes from God? That's a non-trivial uh, appellation there. How do you know that? And there are several verses that give us clues on how to do that. But uh, one way you do is to test it. That's what John will emphasize in his first uh, letter and that's also it's emphasized in Revelation chapter 2 in the first of the seven letters uh, churches and that you test it by the word of God that's the yardstick the scripture tells you to teach to, to measure your teachers and we'll talk more about that before the evening's over Jesus answered and said unto him verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God how many have heard that before? Okay, it's a well overworked phrase. It's not translated quite accurately by it. Not born again, but born from above is what it really is translated. The word born again is uh, genethai uh, anathan. It's used 13 times in the New Testament with four different meanings. From the top, from above, from the first, or from the beginning, or again. Born again is, is an allowable, but it's only one of several. It really is born from above is the concept that is being expressed here. And uh, so Jesus replied, and Nicodemus was very cryptic and yet very abrupt. He informed that no man could even see the kingdom of God without a spiritual rebirth. That's his, that's his premise here. We're jumping right into what's probably the deepest doctrine in the Bible, this whole idea of the spiritual rebirth, regeneration, if you will. See, birth is our mode of entrance into the world and brings with it the potential equipment for adjustment to the world. Okay? To be born from above means a transformation of a person so that he is able to enter another world and adapt to its conditions. That's why the term born from above isn't just a figure of speech. It's a very descriptive term because there's a recreation going on here. And so... Jesus answered and said to him, except, uh, said to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that word see is an interesting word. The, uh, it's, it's just translated see here, but it implies discernment or perception of meaning rather than simply registering a, registering a uh, visual image. And uh, there's a different Greek word you'd use if you just meant to see it in a visual sense. No, this means to really experience it, to really perceive it. And so we're dealing with regeneration. The necessity of the new birth grows out of the incapacity of the natural man to see or enter into the kingdom of God. That's an intrinsic, basic incapacity that's being dealt with here. However gifted, however moral or refined, the natural man is absolutely blind to spiritual truth and impotent to enter the kingdom 
for he can neither obey, understand, or please God. And there's an abundance of scripture that nails that down all the way through the scripture. Jeremiah 17.9 is one of the choices once here where Jer God through Jeremiah says that the natural man, he, he, the heart of man is incurable. Desperately wicked is the way it in, is in the English, the King James. But the word actually means not just, it means incurable. Nowhere in the Bible do you have a heart cured or repaired. No, it's always replaced. Very key uh, uniformity through the scripture. And uh, the new birth is not a reformation of the old nature. You can't reform the old nature. But it's a creative act of the Holy Spirit. It's very interesting to see how that's emphatic in the language. We're talking about a new birth, not a repair of an old, a new creation. And uh, we talked about in the very first chapter of John that he became the, he granted them the, the power to become sons of God, to be direct creations of God again. And so... The condition of the new birth, the condition of it, is faith in Christ crucified. And we're, before this chapter is out, that specific is going to be emphasized. Not just Christ in general, not just that he's a great teacher, not just that he did miracles. No, no, no. The cross turns out to be the key to the whole thing. We'll get there. Through the new birth, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature and the life of Christ himself. And that's present tense, not future tense. We'll get into that too as we go here. We're down to verse 4. We're making progress here. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, if you look at this naively, you say, Boy, you know, he doesn't get it. No, he's trying to get at the reality of what he's really trying to communicate here. There's actually two questions being asked here. The possibility of a new birth is being questioned, and then the process by which it happens is being questioned. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee... You know, that's an interesting phrase that Jesus uses. When he wants to emphasize something, he'll say, I say unto you such and so. If he wants to underscore it, he says, Verily, I say unto you such and so. When he wants to really underline it, he does this occasionally. Verily, verily, truly, truly, in other words, Verily, verily, I say unto you. That's a way of paying attention to what's following, okay? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's trying to get across these are two very different things. And uh, flesh is sarx. It, it, uh, it's used here in terms of humanity. And uh, um, that was echoed in our first chapter. We went through all that before. But... Uh, and, but even the word itself carries a hint of the corrupt nature, the flesh, the, the hum, humanity in the sense of its incapacity. Jesus continues, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. In other words, you're not going to sense that in the usual natural senses. And the word, he's playing puns here because the word wind in both the Hebrew and in the Greek. In the, in the Hebrew, it's ruach, and the Greek, it is pneuma. But in both languages, the same word for wind is also the word for the Spirit. Those, those are deliberate puns, if you will. Yes, the Holy Spirit uses puns, and here's an example of it. And uh, pneuma is used about 370 times in the New Testament, and all but once... The reference is to the Spirit, not wind as we normally think of it. Okay? And what he's emphasizing here is the sovereignty of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not subject to our devices. It is sovereign. And that's another thing we should be, as, as we get into that subject, to really understand. In fact, it's kind of interesting to compare what's going on here with the creation in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, 12, and 21, it always emphasizes that what comes forth was after its own kind. All the way through, as you read that first chapter, everything that comes forth is after its own kind. And there's broader parallels drawn there in chapter 1 to darkness. So the spirit broods and there's light after their kind. See, again, it's, 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 it's uh, the light. is we went, we went through that whole metaphor thing in that first chapter. 
Now compare this with John 3. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. No one gets a change of heart. That's a phrase we might use linguistically. The scripture doesn't. Jesus gives them a new heart, born of the water and born of the spirit. It's a, it's a, from the beginning, new creation. Now this leads to some confusion. Some people assume because it makes reference to water, that's referring to baptism. Very, very common presumption, but be careful. There's no mention in the Old Testament about being saved by baptism. The, the, rit, uh, the ritual of baptism had ceremonial ritual effects, and that is emulated in, in from Acts chapter 2 on, but the, 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 there's no use of that in the Old Testament as being saved. And as you think about this, remember the repentant thief on the cross. He was on the cross, unsaved, but repentant, and Jesus announces him saved. There was no chance for him to be baptized. And, uh, and there's a lot to learn from that, not the least of which is baptism is recommended but not essential. That's a big controversy among many. Many may not agree with me, but I'm going to... We have that view, and I don't expect you to accept it, but I'll show you why we hold that view as we go on. See, you want to be careful not to put works in the way of grace. All our benefits from Christ are by His grace, not by anything we do. And uh, to try to add to grace is blasphemous. Strangely enough, water is used emblematically all through John's writings, chapter 4, chapter 7. We're going to run into this again and again. He uses water as an emblem, not, not in the connection with baptism directly. And uh, baptism is associated with the word throughout the scripture and is used for cleansing in, in Ephesians and elsewhere. And we'll deal with that further as the, as the gospel unfolds. Well, we're down to verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? See, Jesus regard they, they, he thinks this is primary stuff. And he's astonished because Nicodemus isn't a guy off the street. He is not a teacher as translated in King James. There's actually a definite article there. It actually says, The teacher... He's the teacher. He was well-known, respected as an authority. Nicodemus should have known this because it's in the Old Testament, by the way. number of verses, we'll just pick one to take a look at at this, in Ezekiel uh, chapter 36. uh, And God says to Ezekiel, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, and from all your filthiness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. See, these are Old Testament concepts emerging here. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, in other words. And uh, so a new heart will I give you. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. And that's a future, that's a prediction, and I won't get into all that here. But the concepts there are evident in the Old Testament. Back to John chapter 3, picking up at verse 11. Jesus continues, says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Good question. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting here, that Jesus uses plural verbs himself in discussing this with Nicodemus. And uh, we find we, 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 four times, the, Jesus is using the first person plural. And heaven is see a prepared place for a prepared people. He's speaking collectively, not just for himself. Four times. And he continues, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And then we get to this strange verse. Jesus explains to Nicodemus, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. A little one-liner that has profound implications for every one of us for lots of several, about three or four different reasons. And... Uh, and he insisted that he would be lifted up. That's a word, by the way. The word that's actually used there is used for the crucifixion in chapter 8 and chapter 12. But that's not crucial to us here. 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man. You can read the entire Old Testament and not find an explanation until John chapter 3, where Jesus gives uh, Nicodemus this insight. And the first point that hit me as just a student of the Scripture is to recognize that that idiom that was inserted in Numbers 21 by the Lord using that emblem was anticipatory of Golgotha. The reason it had such an impact is because it obviously was an anticipatory emblem of something that was going to happen thousands of years later. And uh, that in itself is, is useful apologetically because it's a demonstration of something we've said all along, but you're going to hear it again and again, that these 66 books that we call the Bible are an integrated message. Every detail in the entire message, even though it's written by over 40 different guys over almost 2,000 years, every detail, every number, every place name is there deliberately. And when you peel that onion and look at it, you'll discover not only is it deliberately there, it always, in some way, points to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. And this is one of the cleanest, simplest examples of this. There are hundreds of these. The brass serpent. Why a brass serpent? The serpent was a symbol of sin from Genesis 3. No surprise. Brass, Levitically, was the material that could sustain fire. That's why altars and things were made of brass, because it could sustain the fire. And uh, so it becomes, brass becomes the Levitical emblem of judgment. That's why everything in the tabernacle that's outside the holy place is brass. It always rests on silver sockets because it always rests on silver as this emblem of blood. It rests on shed blood. Everything inside the holy place is not brass. It's gold. And it's designed to look gorgeous when you're inside. And it's covered with these four different coverings, so it's deliberately designed to look awful outside when you're inside. There's a whole study of the tabernacle we talked about last time. I don't want to go through that again. But so basically, the brass serpent is sin being judged. Okay, then why is Jesus raised as a serpent? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, speaking of the crucifixion, it's, Paul says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you discover the real implications of Golgotha and Jesus on that cross, you discover that he, a sinless man, was made sin for us. It says so in a lot of different ways. This is the crispest one, the cleanest one, if you will. That's staggering. In fact, the only time throughout eternity that Jesus didn't call him Father was as he hung on that cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why do you say it? Because he's in our shoes. He's taken our place. We'll talk more about that as this goes. He hath made sin. That incidentally is incomprehensible for most. Most of us cannot imagine a sinless God becoming man and then allowing himself to be made sin for us. And when you think about that, by the way, don't ever look the Father. Anybody that's been a father knows how they would gladly change places with their son in suffering or abuse. Can you imagine the Father looking down and watching what's going on? His forbearance to let that proceed for our benefit. Not only did Jesus love us to endure all that, the Father loved us to endure all that. And as you pray, there's, we could go on and on. Let's move on here. Uh, the apologetic implications, I don't, want to, I don't want to forget there. Crucifixion had not been invented back there in the days of Moses. Stoning was the official form of execution. And yet, this emblem of the raising on a pole was identified in Numbers 21. Long before crucifixion was invented, 
in about the early six, about 60 BC by the Persians and then widely adopted by the Romans, of course. This design was inserted from outside the time domain in anticipation of future fulfillment. This wasn't a lucky guess that the father, that somehow Moses you know, anticipated, no. It also wasn't something that Jesus could have deliberately set up for himself. No, this is staggering. But there's some other, there's some hermene hermeneutics is the study of your theory of interpretation. There's some lessons we learn from all of this by watching this that go beyond just the immediate lesson here. The Jewish rabbis will speak of a remez. A remez is a hint of something deeper. And a remezim is the plural of that. They're hints of something deeper. There is no detail in the Bible that's accidental. Every detail, every number, every place name is there deliberately. And, and uh, it's always, not only is it deliberate, it's always about Jesus. And by the way, when you run into these, you don't have to chase them down right away. Just take comfort in that an explanation will eventually emerge in his timing. And half the thrill of a treasure hunt through the Bible is as these things pop up and you discover them for yourself. Staggering. And it'll reinforce the, the reality that you're dealing with a supernatural product in your lap. And when you discover that for yourself, it changes your whole attitude towards the Bible. The precision, the detail, the staggering. And whenever you find a contradiction, joy, jump for joy. You think you found something in the Bible that contradicts itself. Great! Because as you unravel that, you'll discover a surprise hidden behind it. And there are surprises hidden behind the details. And when you discover them for yourself, they're fantastic. And so, we saw here in John chapter 3 that th this brazen serpent was anticipated from Numbers 21. We've just gone through that. You may recall last time we discovered that the wedding at Cana, I've heard that preached on for over 50 years and no one ever links it to the hashes of the red heifer. And when you do, you got the third day issue, you got its linkage with the temple a strange way, and you discover there again, the last part of that chapter where he's casting out the money changers ties to the first part, the wedding at Cana. That's a little more subtle. I'll leave it up to you to sort through that. Remazim, it's full of it. The, the three-day emphasis all through Numbers 19 on the ashes of the red heifer. And the fact that all of that is linked, even though it's distant from, it's linked to the temple. What temple? The temple that he's going to raise in three days. That's all explained. And it, you miss that unless you've really wanted to dig a little deeper furrow through the thing. Now, the only basis for all of this is the cross. Not as miracles, not as teaching, not as example. No, no, the cross. And that's going to come up in the rest of this chapter here. And this whole incident of the brazen serpent leads to, it's a, it's a verse or two before the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. And that's John 3.16. Jesus continues, that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many have heard that verse before? How many of you have memorized it? Okay, praise God. Okay. The word perish there, by the way, is an unfortunate translation. Um, in no New Testament instance does it signify the cessation of existence or of, uh, or the exist of consciousness. It's a condition to every non-believer. And so... The word uh, apollomy is, uh, is means really marred, rendered useless. It's not perish in the way we might think of it. And that's amply documented through other verses. But here's the verse. For God so loved the world. This is the big one. This is the biggie. And uh, let's talk about that. The word eternal life is misunderstood, by the way. That's not something future. That's not something you look forward to. Boy, when I die, I'll have eternal life. That misses what he's saying. First of all, why did God give a son that whosoever believed him should not perish but have everlasting life? And John uses that phrase 16 times throughout his, in just this gospel. Now the Greek aionios and the noun zoe implies that eternal life begins at the moment of faith and never ends. 
It's not something you get when you die. It's something you have now whether you know it or not. You don't have to wait until you die to have eternal life. You have it now. And it's more than endless existence. It's sharing the divine life. And you try to embrace that one, it really gets wild. Now, it's a, God so loved the world. The word in the Greek is cosmos. The word for world, it really means bringing order out of chaos, is what the word actually means. That's why it's also the root word in the term cosmetics. Bringing order out of chaos. Okay. Okay, I have to work that in. Nan will take me to task when I get home over that one, but that's fine. No, see, the world is under judgment. We're going to be shocked when we get to John 17, because when Jesus prays, he emphasizes to the Father, I don't pray for the world. Really? What's all that about? Well, we'll get there in John 17. But uh, the world is under judgment, we know from John 9, that will be emphasized. It's in the control of its prince, which is Satan. Who's the god of this world? And John will deal with that in chapter 12. So it's in control of the prince, Satan, but it's yet overcome by Christ in John 16 and following. So now if we take this verse that we've all memorized, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's interesting to dissect that a little bit. For God, that's the greatest being conceivable, right? So, that's the greatest degree, loved, the greatest affection, the world, the object of that love, that he gave, that's the greatest act, is to give, his only, the greatest treasure, namely, the greatest relationship, the begotten son, the greatest gift, the greatest company, that whosoever, there ain't larger groups than whosoever, okay, believeth the greatest trust in him, the greatest object of faith, should not perish, that's the greatest deliverance possible, but have, present tense, greatest assurance, the greatest promise of everlasting, life, of course, the greatest blessing. Each one is, is uh, clearly the superlative, not the comparative, the superlative and all the way down the list. That's why that has such incredible power, the, the more you study it. And, uh, boy, we could go on and on, but I'll spare you that. Let's we keep moving here. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's a heavy verse. I didn't say that. He did. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, we spent a lot of time in that first session about metaphors and some of the depth of them. Metaphors reign where mysteries reside and we went through the light thing. We're not talking about light in the usual sense here. Far beyond that. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than life because their deeds are evil. There's a shocker in the middle of this thing. The word love there may surprise you as to which of the several Greek verbs it uses. Men desire, the desire of men was to remain blind. Men agapeo, darkness rather than light. The verb agapeo isn't God's love. That's the noun used in a special way. Agapeo, as a Greek verb, means to be totally given over to. Wow. Loved darkness rather than light. The verb is to be totally given over to. Men love darkness rather than light. That's their choice. See, the, the whole issue of faith in God is not about reason. Yes, there's a reason for the hope that is in you, and you need to be able to declare that, but that's not how you get, to get there. People flee it because of accountability. It isn't the great intellects that are saved. It's the ones that are humble before, before their creator that are saved. That's why pride with PhDs, PhD stands phenomenally dumb is what it stands for. Is, is, I know because I are one, see, okay. 
Anyway, we're going to verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. See, unbelief is a flight, an attempt to flight, flee accountability. Flee accountability. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And there's a strange phrase here, doeth truth. And uh, in the Greek there, it, it's a phrase used only twice, and both by John. Here in John 3 and in his first letter, he uses that strange, doing the truth. And if you know that truth is also a title of Christ, which he emphasized in the second letter, you'll also discover something most commentators miss, and that is that the second of his three letters was a personal note to, to Mary. And that changes the whole letter once you discover that for yourself. But let's move on here. See, the belief is a participation, not just intellectual acknowledgement. You don't believe the truth, you do the truth. You participate in it. You, you, uh, it, you participate in it. That's your, your goal is to be a metakoi, a, participate, a participant in Christ. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. After these things came Jesus and his disciples in the land of Judea, and he tarried there with them and baptized. In that first phrase, translated into English, after these things, the Greek term there is metatauta. And if you're a student of the book of Revelation, you know that the book of Revelation, the first chapter of 19 verse, gives you an outline of the whole book, divides it into three parts. Things which you have seen, things which are, things which shall be metatauta after these things. And we get to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it opens with that marker. And it is a, a partitioner, if you will, of the book of Revelation, which is one of the several hints that causes me to suspect that John wrote his gospel after Patmos. After Patmos. There are hints of that all through here. This is one of them. It's used a marker in the gospel, and it was also his marker in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 19, chapter 4, verse 1. Well, he's continuing here now. He says, And John, meaning John the Baptist, also was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. And uh, so the exact location of Enon is a little uncertain. There are two possible sites suggested by the commentaries, one south of Bethshan, where there are numerous springs, of course, and the other one is a short distance from Shechem. But of these two, both Eusebius and Jerome mentioned the former one, and that's the more likely one, I think, for a lot of reasons. It's not a big deal one way or the other, for us at least. But, uh, okay. For John was not yet cast into prison. And then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So there are some of John's disciples. Are now, I might, something that's a little confusing. The Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, sometimes called the Synoptic Gospels for a number of reasons, they write about Jesus' public ministry only after John the Baptist is in prison, from which he doesn't escape. He gets martyred, as you know. And so, but in any case, there's a point here, though, where John's disciples are confused. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear ye witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. So John here is underscoring some confusion because his own disciples don't really get it that this other guy is the Messiah himself. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Now understand, John the Baptist is calling himself a friend of the bridegroom. What does that tell you? That tells you he's not the bridegroom, obviously. It tells you something else. He's also not the bride. And people miss that. Okay? Now, there are many scholars, most scholars, assume that the body of Christ and the bride of Christ are synonymous. And I'll share with you candidly that I'm among a very small minority that suspects they're not synonymous. They mean almost the same thing. Watch out for that almost. Because between the difference may be a discovery. And it's still under study and it's very controversial, so I, want, I just want to alert you not to jump to conclusions that they are exactly synonymous. 
They may be, they may not be. The bridegroom, okay. Jesus is going to use this metaphor of himself in Mark chapter 2. And Paul uses that same metaphor in 2 Corinthians 11 and Ephesians 5. And John, the author here, uses it not only here, but he uses it twice in the experience at Patmos, the book of Revelation. So it's, it's a very, very useful uh, idiom to be sensitive to. But, he, but uh, John the Baptist instructing his disciples, he says, speaking of Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So that's his extolling there. And uh, see, the more I'm occupied with Christ, the less I shall be occupied with myself. And that should be true of all of us. He's what it's all about. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Set to his seal that God is true. That's just an underscoring of the security we have, and there's plenty of verses you can track down in your notes if you want to challenge that for some reason. And it's also authenticated in John 6. We're going to deal with this when we get there again. And, of course, even Esther 8 and elsewhere. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. There's no restriction. You just have two teaspoons full. No, no, he's without measure. The Father loveth the Son, and get get this phrase here. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Now, one of the studies you can undertake on your own, I encourage you to do so, is you can take every major event in the Bible, from the creation to the uh, birth of Christ, to the ascension of Christ, uh, well, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ. You can take every major event in the Scripture and you'll discover verses that ascribe it to the Father in other places that ascribe it to the Holy Spirit, every one of them, and ascribe it to the Son. And it's if you go through that exercise and pull those all together, it's an astonishing uh, persuasion that the three are distinct but yet unified. Echad, one, in the, in the sense of unity. And it, you'll find the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity, is all through the Old Testament, not just the New. But you really want to dig that out for yourself to really get the most max- max- benefit out. He that believeth on the Son, oh, here's a, another one of your favorite Bible verses. He that believeth on the Son hath, not will have, hath, present tense, everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, he that believeth not is a... Unbelief is active, not passive. It is a willful disobedience against God, is the, is the grammar here. The son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This is the only place in any of John's epistles or his gospel that he uses the word wrath. But he uses it six times in the book of Revelation. Everlasting life does not mean eternity later in heaven. I think I've already emphasized that. The believer already possesses that life right now. It is the life of God in the believer. It's hard for us to imagine what that means, that the life of God indwells us now. See, what what we're dealing with here is not denominationalism. We're not dealing with um, anything other than a personal, one-on-one relationship with Him. A living relationship. You've been born into a new family. It is a loving relationship. It's the relationship that's modeled between the the bridegroom and a bride. God uses the marriage throughout the entire scripture as a model of intimacy. Far beyond the husband and wife thing. That's just intended as a model of him communicating what he really means by intimacy. 
It's a loving relationship. And that's a whole study on its own, of course. It's also a learning relationship in which we meditate on the Word and we make it part of our lives. It's a lifetime thing. This is not something you do by attending you know, uh, a meeting now and then or even a weekly study group. That's great. No, no, it's a lifetime endeavor. It's a lifetime treasure hunt. But I want to pause for a minute and pick up another thread that I started earlier. The foolishness of God. You know, it's hard to even imagine a sentence with both those words in it. Foolishness of God? You got, they, they, they must be antithetical. Have you ever noticed that God often seems to resort to strange or bizarre remedies? Obviously, the brass serpent is a springboard here. The foolishness of God. God decides to wipe out the entire world, probably several billion people. He decides to save nine people. And he says, eight. Oh, there eight. oh, yes, there's one that was pulled out beforehand, God by the name of Enoch. But then you had four guys, known as three sons, and their four wives. Eight. Build a barge to survive and restart the world. Now, the whole flood of Noah is, is a, a, a laughingstock to people who think they've done some homework. Most people who make fun of it haven't done their homework. Couldn't be big enough. How big was it? How many spirits? You, know, you start asking some questions, you discover most people haven't done their homework. And those that have are amazed at what they discover. But that's a whole other thing. Certainly, the whole idea is a strange way of solving the problem, isn't it? And wipe out every save, save eight? Okay, green. Samson with the jawbone of an ass kills a thousand people. I mean, that, you know, why the jawbone of an ass? I mean, was, was, was God just trying to be colorful? I suspect so. And last time we talked about the ash of the red heifer, this weird ritual that even the rabbis don't understand. Why do the, do I, is the guy that's going to get purified over the, the, the seven days on the third day get sprinkled? What, what's the third day, third day, third day, all through that thing? And it all has to do with this... With this Sanctuary, which isn't even involved, and it's distant. What, what, what's going on? Well, we did that last time. This time we got the brazen serpent. It, 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 these are weird things. Let's see what Paul tells us about this. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world. That's his challenge he's going to hit here. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God. You know, there's that phrase. It's, you can't help but stumble. That's a strange collection of words there. I didn't make them up. They're here and I'm taking this out of the this, this scripture. Paul continues there in 1 Corinthians 1. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And I, I, I love this thing. I think it was Queen Elizabeth said she was saved by an M. She said, claimed she was saved by an M. Because she noticed here, he doesn't say not any noble. He said not many noble. So she felt she was saved by the M. I like that. But Paul continues, And the base things of this world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Well, you know, it's pretty interesting. We talked about the Noah's barge, Samson's jawbone, Ash the red heifer, and of course the brazen serpent. What's the ultimate foolishness of God? What foolishness of his strikes us as the strangest of them all? A wooden cross erected in Jesus. The entire universe, everything, past and future, is all measured by an event that occurs on Golgotha. Isaiah said, a child is born, a son is given to us, and so forth. We always quote that at Christmas. Not synonymous. The child is born, it was in Bethlehem. The son that was given was at Golgotha. 
separated by 33 and a half years and uh, by what, 20, 30 miles, yeah. whatever. Here's the answer. For the, in, in verse 18 of the passage that we're reading, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. This is a very disturbing verse for a number of reasons. There are only two categories in this verse. To them that perish, it looks foolish. That everybody, everything, every event, all of history is going to be measured by the events relating to a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the very hill on which it stood. Now, one is them that perish is the one group, the other group unto us which are saved. One thing I want you to notice from 1 Corinthians 1.18, there are only two categories. And the thing I want you to think about, I don't want you to raise your hands, I just want you to think about it for a minute. In which category are you? I know what your first reaction is, but I'm going to challenge you. Are you really sure? Are you really sure? I'm going to close with just Philippians 2, 12 and 13, where Paul admonishes us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, his good pleasure. See, we don't want, there's not an altar call to come down here, every head bowed, and I know I'm not going to do that here. I want you to become what's known as a self-feeder. I want you to come to conclusions from your study, not because I recommended something. There's some hazards I want you to be aware of. One way you protect yourself from error is to rely on the whole counsel of God. Stay away from one verse theology. Everything should agree. And test all things by the word of God, not some influential speaker, whoever he might be. It's the word of God, not men, however influential they might be. Your eternity depends on your diligence, not theirs. So with that, for the next session, I'd like you to prepare for next time. I'd like you to study chapters 4 and 5. So we'll make a little... We've, we've spent some time going slowly to set some foundation here, but we'll move on a little bit. We'll pick two chapters next time. And as you read those chapters, I want you to explore three healings that occur. I want you to identify four witnesses, four different witnesses, and I want you to understand two resurrections. All that in these two little chapters. And with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you who, for who you are. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the extremes that you've gone to that we might have life and life abundantly. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for your presence in our lives. And Father, we do pray that your purpose in each of our lives will be achieved, not by power or by might, no, but by your Spirit. As we commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever,